Um, first, I'm going to introduce uh, Aaron McKellar, who is a fourth year PhD student in the history of, architecture, uh, history of architecture at Boston University. In 2010, she received her MA in art history from the University of Illinois at Chicago, where she began focusing on design cultures of the 1940s. Her dissertation, Tomorrow on Display, American and British Housing Exhibitions, 1940 to 1955, investigates how exhibition curators visualized, materialized, and concretized abstract ideas about town planning, dwellings, and home furnishings for approval and consumption by a skeptical but curious lay public. Uh, in March of this year, the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art awarded her a junior fellowship uh, to continue research on this topic. Uh, and she currently teaches courses in the history of interior architecture and design at Boston Architectural College and at Boston University. So uh, I will now welcome uh, Aaron McKellar. Thanks, everybody. It's so nice to see, although, of course, I can't see you because it's dark, so many of you here. Um, for what promises to be a very exciting weekend of talks. Okay. Writing for The Observer in 1944, Alison Settle praised the London showing of American housing in war and peace for tackling the problem of the post-war dwelling. Here she noted that American architects and designers were, quote, concentrating on dwellings which are homes. They realized that the fighting men on their return, having had enough of communal life in the services, will value privacy above all else. The Americans, as we must, are fighting the battle for adequate house living space. That settled defined dwellings as homes is significant. While dwelling refers specifically to shelter, home implies additional cultural value. Moreover, she drew a distinction between communal living and homes that provided for a nuclear family. In its display, American Housing and War and Peace made it clear to visitors that the ideal post-war dwelling was intended for a family unit. These ideas reflected a belief widespread through both the US and Britain that family life formed the basis of a happy existence and which saw the home as the first priority in reconstruction because family life was the most important aspect of life. And the cultural value that Settle acknowledged was also a political and patriotic one. The poster for American War and Peace, which you can see on the screen, exemplifies this political value by depicting the blueprints for a house with the American flag stripes flashing on the blueprints verso, making the visual claim that America literally supported the act of building the family home. And we can look at American housing and war and peace as the culmination of wartime research into ideal forms of post-war reconstruction. As the Second World War initiated defense projects, destroyed cities from above, prompted material shortages, and demanded participation from average citizens, housing advocates on both sides of the Atlantic seized an opportunity to rethink dwellings on a mass scale. The war thus enabled architects to experiment with improving family life for the post-war years. In Britain, one organization that engaged these questions was the Reconstruction Committee of the Royal Institute of British Architects, which formed in March 1941 to respond to the three million homes throughout Britain that had been damaged or destroyed by aerial bombings. The committee promoted its ideas in two major exhibitions. In 1943, the first of these exhibitions, Rebuilding Britain, visualized ideas about housing outlined in the Beveridge Report. In 1944, American Housing and War and Peace, which was co-sponsored by the U.S. Office of War Information and organized by the Museum of Modern Art in New York before going on display in London, contended that Britain could learn from America how to plan large-scale housing developments and build them with speed and economy. Centering on the family home as the embodiment of the ways of life that both nations sought to defend, Rebuilding Britain and American Housing and War and Peace displayed architect design proposals for planned neighborhoods and modern dwellings. These tools of persuasion simultaneously promoted modern architectural ideas, tried to carve a place for the architect in post-war Britain, 
and demonstrated to wartime audiences the cultural value of the family home. In the process, these displays anticipated an improved post-war future, reassuring visitors that the conflict's end would bring about a better world. So in this talk, which I've broken up roughly into three parts, I'll first outline the professional climate that made planning a priority in wartime Britain. Next, I'll connect the wartime goals of the Reba Reconstruction Committee to this climate and then walk you through the two exhibitions. And then finally, I'll briefly evaluate the efficacy of their modes of display. Starting in the early days of the war, architects anticipated and predicted the post-war world through a process of planning that extended from the individual dwelling to its place within the region. As various planning historians have noted, Many British architectural planning proponents saw the Blitz's damage, much of which had wiped out entire slum areas, as an opportunity or chance to enact comprehensive town plans. Beginning to by planning to reconstruct these destroyed areas, architects and other professionals sought to expand their roles in the town planning process by seizing this opportunity. These individuals understood that the total nature of the war had created a social climate that was hospitable to such change. Moreover, British architects and housing experts saw this moment as a chance to modernize Britain's outdated housing especially, advocating for their role in this process. These professionals almost immediately commenced planning for Britain's re reconstruction, publicizing their work as they went. In January 1941, for example, the popular picture Post magazine special published a special issue entitled A Plan for Britain. This issue looked back to 1918, when the nation had emerged from the First World War with no comprehensive plan and insisted, we can be better prepared, but we can only be better prepared if we think now. This process of planning, too, connected to Allied wartime goals. Quoting from the same issue, our plan for a new Britain is not something outside of the war or something after the war. It is, indeed, our most positive war aim. The new Britain is the country we are fighting for, and the kind of land we want, the kind of life we think the good life, will exercise an immense attraction over the oppressed peoples of Europe and the friendly peoples of America, end quote. This new, better Britain it hinged on improving family life, as the magazine's cover suggests by picturing children as the future of the nation. Herein, features by future members of the Reba Reconstruction Committee, Maxwell Fry and Elizabeth Denby, outlined how British architects might plan the nation's built landscape and homes to provide pleasant and comfortable places in which to reside. And so here on the screen, we see a sort of old, new proposal where on, the, on your right, or my right, your left, we have the, old, the city as it is presently. Um, and then on your right, we see the city as it could be. And at the heart of it, right up here, we have small houses in their own gardens, which would provide clean and healthy family living. And this occupies, as you can see, a very prominent location within what is Fry's proposal for a planned city. Meanwhile, Denby asserted that architects must plan houses for the needs of families, particularly housewives. She offered a proposal for a convenient and hygienic kitchen that followed modern planning principles, integrated modern technologies, and made use of easy to clean modern materials such as <coughs> linoleum. In an article published by the Architects Journal in December 1941, Kenneth Lindsay, late parliamentary secretary to the Board of Education, built upon these foundations, insisting that British Reconstruction was to be a collaborative effort. In so doing, he argued, British Reconstruction would provide a genuinely democratic example to the, quote, stunted, mechanized German government. And in casting Reconstruction as a democratic effort of extension of the war effort, Lindsay linked architecture with Britain's social life one that was implicitly at odds with that of a totalitarian regime. Here he argued that the home comprised the first priority in the process of reconstruction, followed by community centers and civic buildings, because, in his words, 
family life matters most. By extension, Lindsay acknowledged that instilling in children British values, chiefly those associated with democracy, would first happen at home before extending to the larger community. Further, because fighting the war implied protecting cultural values, the family home stood at the center of this struggle. It's a place in which these values were born, nurtured, and perpetuated. Amid this climate, the Reba Reconstruction Committee engaged architects with questions of town planning, transportation, industry, housing, finance, organization, and administration, all as they related to post-war building. Collectively, the organization's members adopted the belief that policy must precede planning, planning must precede execution, and all of the resources of the building industry must be involved. The family home occupied a central position within the, Reconstructions com the Reconstruction Committee's mission, and from the committee's formation in, 19, in March 1941, a special housing group considered the planning, fittings, and furnishings of both urban and rural housing, recommending appropriate standards for each component. The Reconstruction Committee believed that a large exhibition would best visualize its views on the Britain that was possible in the future. Rebuilding Britain, which went on display at London's National Gallery on February 25th, 1943, educated British citizens about town planning by articulating its significance throughout history, connecting these ideas directly to social policies and proposals that had developed during the war years and positing that planned cities would build a better Britain. Moreover, the Reconstruction Committee solicited the public's participation in doing so as part of the democratic process. Just as Reconstruction should be a collaborative effort, the Committee treated rebuilding Britain as collaboration. No individual member's name appeared on any of the exhibition's materials, including its text and catalog. The exhibition's organizers aimed to convince visitors how British citizens might transform the nation in the post-war years. Visitors to the National Gallery met an opening scene that depicted destruction and alluded to wartime opportunity by displaying a large photograph of St. Paul's Cathedral with an expanse of Blitz London behind it. And we don't have this because there is no picture of it. The overall design of the exhibition space was aimed aimed to render legible the material of rebuilding Britain. Its exhibition coordinators draped the gallery walls to a height of eight feet with dark blue-gray fabric, which formed the backdrop to a series of plywood screens supported by white tubular metal frames. Distinctively colored materials covered each of the plywood screens, each color emphasizing the exhibition's different stages, British architectural inheritance, historic town planning, modern town planning, modern construction, and so on. The metal frames that supported each screen also held reflectors that directed light onto the images on display, mainly, as you can see here, black and white photographs. To offer visitors a palpable sense of what this new Britain might look like, a small number of models also accompanied the exhibition imagery. In the midst of war, the Interdepartmental Committee on Social Insurance and Allied Services, chaired by leading British economist William Beveridge, identified an opportunity to enact the comprehensive social change that would bring about this new Britain. In December 1942, Beveridge published his report on social insurance and allied services. This document identified five giant evils standing in the way of reconstruction, want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness. Because Rebuilding Britain attempted to visualize some of Beveridge's ideas by focusing on the built environment, the Reconstruction Committee invited him to open the gallery by the exhibition by explicitly tying the exhibition's content to the content of his report. His speech, which was broadcast on the radio, declared war on squalor, of course one of his giant evils. To Beveridge, squalor meant that many British people were residing in houses that lacked access to green space. Most of these houses were small, poorly equipped, difficult to keep clean, and inconvenient to workplaces. Beveridge asserted that a planned reconstruction would enable, quote, all citizens to live in an environment that is healthy, clean, and pleasing to the senses, clear of offense to sight, hearing, and smell, giving easy access to work and recreation alike. 
end quote. The solution, he contended, depended on cooperation between Britain's elected officials and its citizens to ensure planned use of land and intelligent use of transport with the guidance of architects as experts. The underlying goal of rebuilding Britain was to rally the British public to demand this professionally planned reconstruction. Although the exhibition's stated goal emphasized the act of rebuilding and thus underscored new building, planning also Im implied preserving the best parts of Britain's built landscape while protecting against unmitigated development. In the exhibition's first gallery, visitors encountered, encountered a sequence that historically traced the nation's inheritance of good building and natural scenery, exemplified in built form by buildings such as Bath's Royal Crescent, pictured here. The purpose of such images was to contrast 19th century industrial development and the so-called evils that this unregulated development had brought to the nation. By extension, the exhibition's organizers sought to make clear that long-term planning was essential for Britain's future development. Planning for future, the exhibition contended, was not at all at odds with a traditional British life, but rather a return to a better way of living. While the exhibition screens no longer exist and few photographs remain to illustrate the specific proposals that Rebuilding Britain conveyed about housing, its many accompany accompanying publications reveal the significant role that housing played within the show as a whole, and much of this centered on rapid construction within a planned framework. For example, a feature within the Architectural Review insisted that post-war housing needs would be on a gigantic scale. Because labor would be at a premium, the Architectural Review advocated for rapid economical construction to ensure the nation's health and well-being. The exhibition presented audiences with the idea that this new construction would fit within carefully crafted civic units, which would form the social structure of the city. Without offering specific proposals for reconstruction, Rebuilding Britain showed visitor, viewers what these units, the district unit, the borough unit, the neighborhood unit, and the residential unit, all of which are pic pictured on the top of this magazine page, might look like and diagrammed how they fit together. The exhibition screen explaining the concept of a residential unit, pictured here, explained that 200 families would form an ideal residential unit. Thus, at the heart of it all, the family comprised the basis for the whole structure. However, because planning concerns more than one family, the exhibition and its accompanying materials demonstrated to visitors how families fit into this greater scheme as part of a larger totality, and the end of the exhibition prompted visitors to demand a planned reconstruction as members of a democratic citizenry. On the heels of rebuilding Britain's success, the Reba Reconstruction Committee decided to stage an exhibition focused solely on housing, a question that rebuilding Britain had only start, begun to explore. Because American architects had gained experience building in quantity through large-scale governmental programs, the REBA turned to the US OWI for assistance. The OWI commissioned MoMA with the task of producing a display that focused on mass production and housing, particularly during wartime, and anticipated some of the problems Britain might face when the war ended. American Housing and War and Peace, which ran from July 19th through August 28th, 1944, centered on prefabrication and standard building as solutions to Britain's housing crisis by allowing architects to design plans that builders could execute on a mass scale. As Rebuilding Britain had done, American ha war Housing and War and Peace displayed photographs, diagrams, and text on freestanding flat wood panels. These, likewise, were color-coded navy blue, white, yellow, and light blue according to their sections which emphasized new materials and methods of construction, modern site planning, and good social organization by illustrating built examples. Conceived and designed by Mary Cook with Catherine Bauer as consultant and British graphic designer F.H.K. Henrian as the London-based display designer, American Housing and War and Peace outlined some of the most innovative American strategies for emergency and low-cost housing. This was a subject on which both Cook and Bauer had amassed considerable expertise.
Cook worked for American housing authorities in Washington, D.C. after returning from Britain in 1935, where she had worked for the architectural firm Tecton. Meanwhile, Bauer was vice president of the California Housing and Planning Association and had been a leader in the movement towards social housing in the United States after the publication of her landmark book, Modern Housing, in 1934. In 1942, observing American wartime building efforts, Bauer proclaimed that the war was providing, quote, vast laboratory experience with experimental building methods and prefabrication, with large-scale community planning, with rental management and upkeep, and with streamlined production processes, all of which Bauer believed would revitalize the building industry in the post-war era. Unsurprisingly, since they both engaged actively with social housing in the US, Cook and Bauer presented housing as a social problem and outlined how American policy and the war emergency had begun to alleviate American living conditions. Many of the exhibition's proposals clearly engaged with their ideas. The exhibition's opening screen, pictured here, and I apologize for the quality, depicts a man, woman, and a baby, a nuclear family, overlaid upon an aerial view of a massive wartime housing development in San Diego. Introductory text on the image reads, U.S. Housing and War and Peace. This imagery would have established for visitors an unmistakable connection between the dwelling, here, relatively anonymous mass housing, and the family. By extension, this imagery served to personalize mass housing by allowing visitors to see themselves in the position of the family. Cook and Bauer endeavored to give families agency throughout the exhibition as well. In terms of social planning, they maintained that community facilities must be provided so that projects could function as neighborhood units and tenants could participate in active cooperation with the organization of their housing. For physical planning, the exhibition contended that long rows of houses on a flat site were unattractive and tended to become run down, that landscape areas should be designed carefully, that small projects were easier to manage than large ones, that walk-ups should be no larger than three stories in height, and that interior standards must be kept flexible. Good examples included, among others, housing rather close to where we are today in Windsor Locks, Connecticut, designed by Hugh Stubbins. Here, staggered site plans afforded families privacy. And so you can see here that there's these triangular formations and these formations where you're not looking directly into your neighbor's windows. Um, interior standards likewise were small but kept flexible and provided residents with modern kitchen, bathroom, and heating facilities. By focusing on these questions, Cook and Bauer contended that Britain could learn from America's wartime experience. The Rebus exhibition announcement expressed an interest in demonstrating how American experience was relevant to Britons, claiming her varied geographical and social conditions meant that the U.S. had experienced many of the housing problems we have met with here in Britain. The Reba maintained that many of the solutions and experience, experiments that American architects had produced during the Depression and in the wartime were relevant to Britain's anticipated need to provide temporary housing while permanent dwellings were being constructed. The Reba, along with various architectural publications, framed the examples of built work shown in the exhibition as stemming from British origins by stating that many of much of American mass housing was inspired by earlier British legislation and planning. So finally today, I'd like to address both exhibitions' portability, which was essential for both of them to function effectively as persuasive tools. This portability, as we'll see, contained two key layers. First, both exhibitions designers conceived their wood panel display screens with portability in mind. Because the initial showings at the National Gallery and at the Rebus headquarters, both in London, would have attracted limited British audiences, both exhibitions visited a number of other locations as well. In the case of Rebuilding Britain, a small committee translated the National Gallery's display onto three smaller versions for the Council of the Encouragement of Music and the Arts to circulate. From 1943 through 1946, 
Rebuilding Britain traveled to more than 40 cities and towns throughout England, Scotland, and Wales, appearing at local museums, but also schools, community centers, libraries, and municipal buildings. This variety demonstrates the large nationwide interest in the exhibition and reveals that local municipalities wish to engage the question of reconstruction. In some of these circulating showings, Rebuilding Britain's broad proposals appears alongside specific local plans for reconstruction. American Housing and War and Peace, meanwhile, traveled throughout England and Scotland from 1944 through 1946, where it too appeared at a range of local galleries, schools, and libraries. The second layer of portability pertains to the various publications that reprinted the content of both exhibitions. As rationing meant that paper was in scarce supply throughout the war, these publications attest to the event's significance and demonstrate that organizers believed it was truly important to make these messages known. Two books accompanied Rebuilding Britain. First, a catalog, here's the catalog, that officially complemented the exhibition, and then later an architectural review special issue which re was republished as a pocket guide and the intention of this pocket guide was to um, quote smooth the path of visitors because the panels contained relatively little text and people were concerned that they would that average people would actually not understand the exhibition's material. In 1944, the Architectural Review also printed a similar special issue that fully recapped American housing and war and peace. <coughs> While the exhibition was still circulating in 1946, Penguin published Homes by the Million, a book that, while not officially affiliated with the exhibition, drew significantly from its content, imagery, and examples to convey ideas about mass housing more effectively to a wide audience. The book's introductory pages even repeated the overlaid imagery that had appeared on the first screen of American Housing and War and Peace, thus creating a lasting connection between mass housing and the family, here recontextualized as facing a new post-war era. This portability, ranging from circulating iterations of both exhibitions to the publications that accompanied them, ensured that average British citizens throughout England, Scotland, and Wales could access these important messages. In so doing, Rebuilding Britain and American Housing and War and Peace not only set out to convince audiences that planning was necessary and to create demand for the architectural profession's role in the nation's impending reconstruction, but also to reinforce the significance of the family home, both during war and peace, reassuring a war-weary British citizenry that a reward lay in sight. Thank you. Thank you.